Good morning, everyone. My name is Dion Molt, and I was trained as an architect. I've also worked in the software development and construction industry, and I've been involved in quite a wide range of open source projects for over a decade. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the growing field of free software in the AEC industry and, and what this means for OpenBIM. And I'll structure this in three parts. I'll start with a small introduction to free software. Uh, then I'll give some case studies of free software initiatives. And what I want to highlight is just how these initiatives enable the industry, you know, how, how it allows people to innovate and actually accelerates the adoption of OpenBIM in the industry. And finally, just to close off, I'd like to uh, let you know how to get involved. So starting with what is free software, uh, free software is not about money. More specifically, it's about four types of freedoms for the users of the software. The first freedom is that the user must be able to use the software for any purpose. They should be able to study and modify the workings of the software. So if the software doesn't do something that you want to use it for, uh, you can then fix it. The third freedom is that you can redistribute the software. So if somebody doesn't have access to these tools, you can share it with them. And fourth, whenever you make any improvements or changes to the code or, or the way that the software works, you're allowed to redistribute this improved version to the public. And that way, the entire industry and the entire community benefits from the work that you're doing. What you'll notice is that there's some similarities, there's some parallels between the objectives of OpenBIM and, and the freedoms of the free software community. But the focuses are slightly different. OpenBIM focuses on the freedom of data, whereas the latter, the, the free software community, is about the freedom of the users of the data. But the end goal is quite similar. It's all about interoperability and collaboration. And I think that we need both focuses. You know, we, we need a strong technical foundation of OpenBIM data standards, but you also equally well need users who are engaged and empowered, and they have to be in control of their own tools. And it's important that these users are what are driving the use cases and the development. And because they are the ones who are providing the grassroots insights uh, that maximize the industry benefit of these standards because you're sure that it's actually targeting business needs. Now, historically, software in all industries have had these four freedoms, but the AAC industry uh, has fallen behind and the majority of users have lost them. They now have to rely on proprietary vendors to deliver whatever they want to do. So, so they, they're no longer in control of their own data. And so any potential benefits of the design of these data schemas uh, it has to go through the vendors. You know, it's slow to market, it's bottlenecked by the vendors, it's constrained by what are the commercial interests are, which is why we need this, this alternate flip side of the coin, this uh, community-oriented approach for the successful adoption of OpenBIM. Because in the future, especially a future when everybody in the workforce knows how to code, people will start to expect this freedom with their data. And so I think in the future, we're going to find that open BIM and free software have a lot more common than they currently do. And I think we'll, we'll do much more than complement each other. I think we'll rely on one another. I'd like to highlight just a couple of initiatives that are, are quite interesting, uh, just, to, just to raise awareness of what's happening. And this is because free software is generally underrepresented in the industry. And... The reason it's underrepresented is primarily a cultural issue. You know, we've normalized our, our way of thinking in terms of vendors and not, not in terms of data. And so I think it's important to raise awareness of these tools so we can start switching the mindset from uh, vendors more towards data. So most AEC users, they've heard of a handful of these tools, uh, but less have actually used them. And, and the big problem with that is because if you don't use it, you don't realize that there's actually a lot more than what I've shown here. The open source architecture community started a directory of free software options related to AEC, and we've managed to list so far over 100 free software options. And they cover a wide variety of sectors, but, but they're not just end user tools. They also include underlying libraries, uh, the libraries that help software developers implement the OpenBIM standards. What's interesting is that if you plot this over time, you see an accelerating trend. Now, I, I don't have time to cover all of these software packages, so I'll just focus on a few. And I'd like to start at the very beginning of this graph and highlight that it, it started with industry investment into free software. And that's what actually started enabling and innovating and accelerating the industry. So this logo that, that I show here comes from the GRASS project. And GRASS is a very old, free and open source software for GIS analysis. It comes from 1984. And it has a modular Unix-like design. 
And the reason it was created was as a solution to non-communicating commercial tools. And the interoperability and its modular design created the term OpenGIS. And this formed the OpenGIS Foundation. And this foundation was the formal connection among the commercial GIS developers. Uh, nowadays, they've changed their name. They're known as the Open Geospatial Consortium. But it's their open data standards uh, that are now fundamental to the GIS industry. Um, GRASS was also one of the founding projects of the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. And the variety of software under their umbrella, but they're all staples in the toolkits of GIS users. This is very, very different to the BIM sector. And they've also started subsequent projects like OpenStreetMaps. OpenStreetMaps now have over 7 million users. Just stepping aside from the popularity and technology, it's a cultural change that has happened. It's, it's normalized the culture of open access GIS data. You know, it can be from a government body, it can be from the private sector, but the end result, increased interoperability, increased innovation, and more important, increased accessibility of the open GIS data. If we move slightly along this timeline, we start getting into the building physics tools. And the gold standards in validated building physics are found in free software. So without these tools, our built environment would be in a very worse off situation. And the ecosystem of building physics tools are able to interoperate due to the open data specifications published by each one of these engines and the modular Unix-like design. But not, it's not just increased interoperability. Here in free software, we also see increased innovation. Let's take a look at Radiance from 1985. It's one of the oldest rendering engines in use today. But Radiance has pioneered so many concepts that we take for granted nowadays in the ArchViz and lighting simulation. Radiance is the reason we have the HDR format. You know, Radiance was the inspiration for other engines to include sun and sky simulations. It invented the concept of exposure control. It invented mimicking physical camera settings. It invented the concept of a normal map back in 1992. Absolutely fundamental to how CG works nowadays. And, and all of these innovations and interoperable ecosystem is now accessible to anyone due to free software initiatives like the Ladybug tools. Ladybug tools have arguably changed our industry. Every single architect right now can perform some basic simulation just after watching a few tutorials at zero cost. What about OpenBIM? OpenBIM did not start from free software like OpenGIS did. It's almost the opposite. You know, it's and STEP, for example, and that's a proprietary format. And it's also a lot more recent in terms of free software. So GRASS and the building physics engines, they've matured for 20 to 30 years. But we don't have the same for BIM. You know, free software implementations for OpenBIM are, are relatively new. The oldest one is ISC OpenShell, I, I think. It's, it's about a decade old. Um, and in that decade, IFC OpenShell now has just over 70 contributors. It's also helped support and enable the development of all of these subsequent projects. It's also used in academia, training material for OpenBIM, because if you really want to teach users about the guts of OpenBIM, free software is your friend. You know, it, it really exposes in a really transparent manner how OpenBIM works. Now, I'm going to focus on two of these in particular because they deal with model authoring. And model authoring is a really hard topic. And historically, uh, there hasn't been a free software initiative. But now it's, I strongly believe that it's starting to mature and it's really exciting to see just how close we're getting to delivering projects with only free software. So this screenshot here is FreeCAD. And it was the first to implement OpenBIM that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, it's got a structural tree and it supports a combination of solid mesh annotations and uh, I guess non-geometric objects too. And the models are fully parametric. They allow 2D generation, extraction of any property. It's typical BIM. And you can also export to a series of open data formats. Um, but, but what's special is that it implements uh, IFC in a very explicit and transparent way. So users can create and manipulate IFC structures directly. So they have a very fine grained control of the model output. You know, there's not a, a black box translation at import or export time that you kind of just have to learn how it, how it works. It, it really exposes things like the spatial tree or, or IFC properties directly to the users while they're authoring the BIM model. And I believe this is really important in the authoring of high quality open BIM. Now, this is the same approach taken with the Blender BIM add-on. So our approach is to take users and allow them to directly manipulate the IFC entities. So even things like the geometry types that are used or the representation context, or even how quantities are calculated 
even, even things like owner histories. None of these are just magically happening. The users can control it. And uh, I think FreeCAD also has like a, a built-in flight check you know, to make sure that the data you're producing makes sense for IFC. So what happens when you, when you give users this level of native control over OpenBIM data? And, and th this really surprised me. So one week after the BlendBIM add-on was released, you know, it was just a short script, not much in it. An online user started using it and, and he took it and, and scripted it in a way to automatically run a daily process to convert compactor machine data for a highway they were building somewhere into a visual format in IFC so that they could collaborate with the rest of the BIM team. And this just highlights what happens when you build free software tools that don't just treat IFC as a, as a translation format, but really place it in the hands of users. Here's another example. This image here, it's not a photograph. It's actually a computer render of, and not just, just a regular computer render, it's a render of an IFC4 model, a direct from the IFC4 model authored with Blender. And Blender is a well-established uh, mesh modeling tool. And in here, uh, the BIM model includes every single blade of grass and leaf, which is IFC geographic element. And this, is, this type of modeling is considered over-modeling with a lot of proprietary tools. Uh, but if you step outside the bubble and move into the CG industry, this is the everyday. So it's, it's quite normal to create models like this. Uh, but more importantly, this is not just an average computer rendering, something that you send off to a CG artist. Uh, this is a physically validated light simulation using radians. So the material data is not something done with a color picker uh, later on in post-processing. All the material data is read directly from the IFC file. And on the left is the photo, and on the right you can see the, the simulation. And, and, and this is really interesting because it just shows us what OpenBIM is actually capable of. Another example is that we've recently integrated Ladybug. So this allows parametric visual node programming for environmental analysis. And that means that in the works is the ability to convert IFC into the Honeybee JSON open data format. So the IFC data can be processed by all of the building physics engines. So we don't rely just on GBXML. And that's not just the only experimental format. Here we can see a point cloud data. We store that point cloud data in IFC. We've got experimental conversion into HDF5. Uh, there's also experimental support for IFC XML, IFC JSON version 4 and 5A, and also full support for all of the entities in BCF. Uh, we, we, we haven't yet supported 100% of the entities in the IFC schema, but uh, making progress. And we believe by exposing these formats to users, you know, instead of waiting for users to ask for them, maybe we can inspire people to help test the latest and upcoming development of the, of the schema allows for. Here's another example when you take a bottom-up approach, you know, when, when users are driving what they want to see in the schema. This is 2D documentation. Now, Building Smart removed a lot of these 2D entities from the IFC spec, but the community really, really needs them. You know, they, the 3D model is only half the data about the project. But the good news is that when Building Smart was removing entities, they, they missed a few. So with the few that they left behind, we've been able to round trip them. We've round tripped IFC annotation and text literal objects that store dimensions, annotations, labels, and all the rest of it, just all in the IFC file. Uh, we've also created things like a, a convention for smart annotations. Uh, if you have IFC text that wants to refer to a piece of data, uh, it can be uh, replaced uh, with IFC data. All of the geometry also stores the relevant uh, annotation geometry subcontext and all the target views. So when you can actually extract 2D documentation directly from the IFC file. Once you extract it, we can bake it and we bake it into the SVG open data standard. And SVG is quite interesting because it stores semantic data. So we're not just storing lines and polygons, but we also store classes and data attributes. So um, we take a 2D polygon and we can query them, for example, with XPath, and we can actually say, hey, uh, this polygon, what, you're actually part of an original IFC element. And we can find the global ID of that IFC element, material name, or any arbitrary IFC property that the user wants to store. The visual styles, things like stroke widths, colors, fills, hatch patterns, arrowheads, these are set on the client side using CSS selectors. So you translate the rich 3D open BIM into rich 2D vector data, and it's semantically display the styles. And because it's just SVG, you don't need specialist software to view it. A standard web browser, cross-platform, any device, completely for free, you can view it. And with HTML and JavaScript, we'll probably add some layers of interactivity so you can query it as a 2D medium. Another thing that users are asking for is how do you specify exchange requirements? Now, there's some issues with MVDs, and I think work has just started in IDS. 
but there are actually existing uh, ways of specifying uh, exchange requirements in software that we call unit tests. So we took all these contractual and client requirements, all in real projects, so we know that it's actually solving business needs, and we translated them into IFC unit tests. And uh, some of these are project specific, but other ones are, are not. So we've now published a directory of 65 standardized exchange requirements. And these are grouped into template definitions, and we group them into something that we call a micro MBD, because they test for very small aspects of the data. This is part of a standard plain text BDD and is a fully automated test, and it can be implemented on any software test runner. And it outputs JUnit XML standard format, so it can be parsed by standard CI environment. Uh, so we ship the cross-platform test runner, one hour training session, the users can run the test, but they can also start defining their own requirements. Once we got that done, we started certifying common vendors. You know, Can vendors actually produce this required data? But more importantly, can they do it in a practical manner that you can implement on a real project. And when they fall short, we provide user guides and workarounds so that projects can still get the most out of open BIM despite the vendor shortcomings. Uh, another example is in the structural space. Here's a project to convert ISC structural elements into input files for CodeAster, which does structural simulation. Uh, one of the byproducts of this is the web-based ISC structural viewer. Hopefully a structural element in ISC mature, this can be one of the tools that help it mature. Apart from other disciplines, we also attempt to use Open BIM across all project phases. So one that's not talked about so much is early concept design or feasibility. So here's one example of a 3D sketch concept environment. You can view it in VR natively in Blender. Now half of it's modeled, the rest is a, is a colored 3D sketch. This exports as a 7 megabyte IFC file and works across other vendors. So you can see cutting through sections in Revit here. Here's another example. We use non-manifold spaces modeled and we assign classifications to them. And this, we can use some topological analysis and generate a full building purely in IFC format. IFC space, IFC window, IFC wall, and so on. The geometry styles are arbitrary, can be customized by the users. We can also feed this into an evolutionary solver to generate urban scapes, pure IFC. So there's no manual modeling done here. Uh, we then score these spaces in respect to design intents. Uh, at the moment, we're taking some from the Pattern Language book by uh, Christopher Alexander. Taking a step back from technology, uh, there are also some really interesting workflow initiatives called Opening Detail and Opening Design, where construction details are shared under an open source license. These details are all drawn in 3D with a variety of authoring platforms, and all the geometry is round-tripped using IFC with minimal data loss. So to do this, a custom MVD was developed called free MVD, and you specify a very small subset of the geometry and material data. And this demonstrates that only with a small part of the schema, as long as you follow it strictly, you can still get very tangible benefits out of it. And here's an example of a project delivered with it, and the workflow of delivering this product is also open source. So it's just like Wikipedia. Anybody online can edit the BIM model and push changes back to the central repository using standard version control systems. As the digital sector and AC kind of matures, this type of way of working might be a little bit more common. There's a lot more I haven't covered, um, but I hope this will give a brief glimpse into what's happening with the open BIM and open source community. And the community is really new. It's hosted at osarch.org, and it only started earlier this year. We've discovered there's a growing community of users really asking for these tools, and they're seriously investing time into learning and developing open BIM technologies. We're now at 850 members and counting. We've got a growing wiki. We've got articles teaching open BIM concepts. They provide best practices for open BIM, uh, not only for free software, also for proprietary applications. Uh, we've got monthly meetups on how to push these further. So uh, for example, the, the last one was about open source ecology. This was originally given in a TED talk, designing open source modular hardware at a fraction of commercial prices to build all of society's needs. Uh, currently working on a modular housing project, $50 per square foot, all done using an online collaborative open source workflow, only using open source software. So if, if any of these initiatives I've shared today are interesting, you can find out more at osr.org. Uh, if you know how to code, uh, there are lots of ways to get involved. There are plenty of OpenBIM libraries available. And all the modeling environments come with a full development environment. Uh, if you're not interested in coding, uh, there's also ways to try out new tools, help with testing, providing feedback and bug reports, and live support channels so you can speak directly to the developers. And hopefully, as all of these tools improve, 
uh, they're all shared with the industry in a collaborative fashion so that the entire industry benefits from it. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much.